We met in college uh, at Texas A&M a long time ago and got married about a year after that, a year and a half after that. But we knew right when we met each other that uh, God had something special. It was just the two of us for about three years and we had one child and three years later had another. Now we have two adult families underneath us and uh, four, four, grandchildren. four grandchildren. We've definitely seen the sovereignty of God's hand on our lives through all the different moves that we've had to do. Um, Brian's job a lot of times would end and we didn't know when the next job was coming. We would often move and not know anybody and not know anything and, and we routinely saw God just provide one way or another during the, during mm -hmm. the moves. Um, and you know, even this last move, which came out of the clear blue, our goal was always to get back closer to home, closer to family, closer to people we know in Texas. And we thought this was it. This was going to be the move. And uh, two opportunities came and went. And, and then this, this one opportunity came out of the clear blue uh, somebody called me and wanted me to be involved in produce, and I've never been involved in produce. And next thing I know, I've got a job opportunity. Yes, moving to California was the hardest because most of Brian's jobs would last two to three years, and I knew that I could put up with two to three years anywhere for a while. But the move to California was going to be longer because they wanted him here until he retired. And that meant at least a good 10 years. And that was hard to swallow. And I cried and I cried. But I knew once again that God loved me so much that he wasn't doing this to be mean to me, to retaliate or just, but he had a plan. One of the cool things that, that we did get to look and see, one of the reasons we're here is that a couple of years ago when Nate came up to us and said, hey, um, we're going to start up in a, a new campus. And uh, he didn't know it, but we'd gone through that twice before already. And uh, then we were able to say yes. And we, we love doing that. Yeah. You know, if, as we look back over our life, we can see God has been in control from the moment we, before, the, before we ever met, but when from the moment we met, through our relationship, um, through the raising of kids, through the moving of jobs, God has always been there. God has always been uh, relevant. He's always been active in our lives. We felt His presence. Whatever it is, Lord, that you want for us, um, you've taken care of us in the past, and you've been with us uh, in the good times and the bad. And so whatever you want for us, we will do. Even because. If even if it means getting out in that deeper water even that, if it's where in we the haven't been water, before. That's right. And also I've come to the point that I can say, Lord, if I never move close to family, I trust you that you have something different for me and I'm okay with it. And just to be able to um, trust him. Yeah, rest in knowing that rest, he is good. Uh, that's exactly right. And to say, it is well with my soul mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I know that God loves me and he's with me and won't leave me. Yeah. Isn't it encouraging to see a couple who understands that God is on the throne, God's involved in their lives, and when things are going really smooth and nice, God's in charge, but when you get sent somewhere that's not close to your family where you don't really plan to be for 10 years, God's still on the throne. I mean, there's a confidence in that. And I wonder, I wonder if we, in a normal day, understand how interested God is in our lives. I mean, how, how truly interested. We talked last week about the God who, out of Psalm 8 and Psalm 19, the God who made the heavens and the earth and all the universe and the vastness of everything. And that God is incredibly interested in our lives and involved in our lives. We're going to see in Psalm 139 that we're going to look at today in this, in this psalm mixtape. We're looking at this, this, these 150 songs in the Bible called the Book of Psalms are God's divine mixtape to walk us through all of life. And in Psalm 139, there's this powerful message that God is involved in our lives and God cares more than we imagine. Even in our mother's womb, before your parents named you, God knew you. 
And God was shaping and forming and watching over you, even in your mother's womb. It's a profound reality how God is interested and involved in our lives. I think as I was growing up, I didn't think much about, I mean, in my teenage years, I didn't grow up in a believing home. I didn't grow up in a church-going home with any sense of faith at all. And so I didn't, there's lots of things I just didn't think about that didn't hit my radar. The idea of a God who watches over you, I didn't even believe that there was a God. But, but I remember when I was 13 years old, 1976, uh, I started thinking about life in a different way. And it was because a, a record album was released by a guy named Stevie Wonder. It was called Songs in the Key of Life. And that album, I got that album, and I listened to that album over and over and over again. And I was so, and, and really, that, that album was just a story kind of of life. And there was one song in particular that got me for the first time at 13. It's the first time I ever thought about what would it be like someday if I had a child? What would it be like to be a dad? Because on that album, there was a song called Isn't She Lovely? And, and you know, Stevie Wonder sings about the birth of his daughter. And he says, Isn't she lovely? Isn't she wonderful? Isn't she precious? You know, less than one minute old, he's just reveling in the beauty of this, this, this beautiful little baby girl, and he's celebrating the gift of this life. And at 13, I started thinking, what would it be like to be a dad, to have a little child? And I didn't know for a while, uh, but the day come along when I met a beautiful woman, we got married, uh, we eventually had three sons. And, 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 I, and I think of, of just all that was involved in, in raising little kids and all that kind of consumed my heart and my mind, saying, look and saying, I have, you know, I have three sons. These are my boys. And I, and I always remember Sherry helped, and, but um, <laughs> she, she did her part. But uh, no, it's an incredible partnership, and she was the senior partner, no question about it. Uh, but, but, but this reality that with each of our boys just... Uh, and and even, even that process, when each of our boys was in the womb, praying for them. I don't know how many of you started praying for your kids when they were conceived, when they were in, you know, in, in the womb. Uh, each of our boys talking to them, dreaming about them, thinking about them. We actually, we actually lost a child between our first and second with a miscarriage at the end of the third, third trimester. And that was hard because we were already praying for that little child and looking forward. And all of a sudden, that child was gone. And that was, that was a, one of those things that we walked through as a couple. But this whole journey of, of children... And I still remember with each of our boys, one of my jobs I was really good at was swaddling our boys. You know what swaddling is where you take like a little blanket and you lay them in the blanket and you kind of put their arms at their sides and you kind of wrap it over and over. It's like making a little burrito. So you kind of like put the tortilla in, but you got a little baby. And then, and then when you wrap it up, their little arms are all like pinned down like this and they're all snuggled up. And when they're born, they're just so tiny, you know? And I still remember with each of our boys holding them, this little child in my arms, and looking out at this little face and just, and just like endlessly kissing their little face because they, they could not stop me. I can't do that now. They're 30 and 28 and 26 and I can't catch them. But, uh, but just holding them and, and just, just in my arms and just loving these little children and thinking what's going to be like to walk with them through their life. Psalm 139 is a psalm that kind of captures that heartbeat. And I want to read this psalm to you and I want you to hear it not as a Bible passage. I want you to hear it as a prayer because that's what it is. It's a song that's a prayer and I want you to hear it not just as a prayer. I want you to pray it as I read it. Can you try to do that in your own heart and your mind? And you don't have to bow your head and close your eyes. We're gonna have a sermon series coming up later about the fact that you don't have to close your eyes when you pray. Hold another topic. But don't bow your heads. Don't close your eyes. Just, but make this your prayer in your heart and I want you to notice as I read this prayer and as we make it our prayer, the hands of God. Again and again, there's these pictures of how God's, God is intimate and involved and how he touches and how he moves and how he makes and shapes and forms and knits and forms. And, and the theologians would, the idea of God having hands, the theologians would call that an anthropomorphism. Isn't that a good word? Anthropomorphism. It's when we take human characteristics and give them to God because we can't understand a God who's beyond our understanding. But the idea is that God is so involved, it's like he's touching our lives and has his hand upon us. And so listen to Psalm 139. We're gonna read verses one through 16 and pray this in your heart with me. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit. You know when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and you lay your hand 
upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too lofty for me to attain. I mean, where can I go from your spirit? Where could I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, and if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, and your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, well, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being, and you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body and all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Wow. God the God we worship, this God, one, son, one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the God we gather to worship, he is intimately involved in your life. He loves you more than you comprehend or know. He is not some absentee landlord who got the universe started and wandered away. He is present from your mother's womb to this day today and this moment right now to the end of your life and into eternity. God has a plan. That's why he came to this world. That's why Jesus came and died on the cross and rose again and paid the price for all of our wrongs. Because God so loves you, he wants to spend forever with you, not just this life. And through faith in Jesus, when our sins are washed away, we have eternity with God. It's amazing, the greatness of the love of God. And so let's not think about God as some distant universe starter who just kind of stands aloof. Let's understand that th th this God wove us and made us and knit us together in our mother's womb and has loved us from before anyone else ever knew or saw us. He loved you even then. He loves you today. And so this psalm, Psalm 139, in God's mixtape of, of all these beautiful songs that God's given to us, to these prayers that help us learn to pray, it declares all kinds of truths. Here's the first truth. And if you're a note taker, you'll find in your bulletin a place to write some thoughts down. If you don't want to take notes, that's fine. But that's there if you want to take a look at it. We learn the first lesson in verse one. I am known by God better than anyone else. Of all the people in the world who know me, God knows me better. Look at verse one. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You have searched me and you know me. God knows, listen closely, God knows everything about you and he still loves you. He knows everything about you, and he still likes you. It's amazing, the greatness of all of God's love for us. The Bible tells us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus didn't come and die on the cross for us because we were good enough. He came and gave his life because we were lost, and we could never find our way back home. And he loved us enough to pursue us, and to seek us, and to come to us. And anytime somebody says, oh, I found God, I'll tell you right now, they're wrong. God found them first. God is the first seeker. He's reaching, had God not reached out to us, we'd have never found him. But he came. He comes by his spirit still. He came by Jesus into human history, and he comes as a loving father. That's the God we worship. So, here's the reality. You have no secrets from God, and he's still fond of you. No secrets. You might be able to keep secrets from your parents. You might be able to keep secrets from your children. I wouldn't want my kids to know. You might keep secrets from your spouse. You may have some, some things hidden from your boss. But here's the truth. God knows it all. Now, that may make you feel vulnerable and exposed a little bit, but that's the way it is. God knows it all. And here's what should, should just blow our minds. And he still loves us. 
every hidden secret, every dark thought. And he said, I love you enough to give my only son for you in an act of love to win you back to myself. That's love. That's God. He knows you more than you comprehend or imagine. And when you realize the fact that the person who wrote this psalm is King David, it says a lot. Because David is saying, God knows everything about me. And David had a, he learned a little lesson about that. David had a few issues and problems in his life. He struggled a little bit. Like, like he committed adultery and had the woman who he committed adultery with had her husband killed. Do you know that King David, the great king of the Bible, uh, King David who wrote many of the psalms inspired by the Holy Spirit, he committed adultery with a woman and had her husband killed. The Bible is not filled with perfect people, just so you know. It's filled with real people who are loved by a real God. And David covered his tracks like we try to cover our tracks with our wrongs and our sins. And he covered it up really well so nobody would ever know. And one day God sent a prophet to David, a prophet named Nathan. And Nathan came to David and he told him a story. Reader's Digest version of the story. David, there was a guy who had all kinds of flocks, lots of wealth, and next to him was a guy who had basically lived in poverty, and they had one little lamb that was their family pet. Think about your favorite puppy dog, all right? Family pet, lots of flocks. The rich guy had company come, and he had to serve them some food. So he took the lamb from his neighbor, their family pet, slaughtered it, cooked dinner, and fed his guests. And David flips out. This is wrong. This cannot be so. This guy has to pay the price. He's all upset about it. It's just a story that, that Nathan's making up. But David, David just gets outraged. And Nathan looks at him and says, David, the story's about you. You're the man. It's not about somebody taking a sheep. You took another man's wife and you had the man killed. David was so outraged at someone else's smaller sin and he couldn't see the greatness of his own sin. And he turned and he repented and he cried out to God. And God loved him and gave him a new beginning and still used him. That's the God we're talking about. So David knew something about the fact that, oh Lord, you've searched me and you know me. So, you have no secrets from God. He's still fond of you, so don't try to keep secrets from God. I want to encourage you this week. Go somewhere quiet for 10 or 15 minutes and say, God, this may be ridiculous, but there's stuff I've been trying to hide from you. And I just need to come and just dump it. I just got to put it all in front of you. And just begin to confess whatever it is you're trying to hide from God. And you ask God this question, do you still love me? God, now that I admit all this stuff, do you still love me? And I'll tell you right now, I know what the answer is. He'll say, that's why I came to this world. That's why I died on the cross, to deal with that stuff, that mess. As dark as it is, yes, I still love you. Verse one, I'm known by God better than anyone else. Next lesson, God knows all that I do. Verses two and three. You know when I sit, when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar, you discern my going out, my lying down, you're familiar with all my ways. God knows everything we do. So here's the spiritual reality. As you walk through your day, remember that God's eye is on you. God is watching you. He knows everything you do all the time. And some of you go, oh, that creeps me out. I don't like the idea of God knowing everything I do. It feels I don't have any privacy, you know. It's, well, no, not with God you don't because he's God. Just the way it works, all right? And some of you, that bothers you, but it shouldn't. It should comfort you that wherever you go, at any time, in any moment of your life, you are not alone. God is so involved in your life. He is near you. He's watching over you, and he still loves you in the midst of all your joys, in the midst of all your struggles. And, and I think about that. I think of different people I've watched through the years who just know, they just have a sense of God's presence with them. And there was a guy, John Shaw, who kind of mentored me when I was a younger pastor. I, when I came to the church I served in Michigan for 14 years, he was the calling pastor. He was in his 70s. He'd already been retired for about 10 years. He was in his 70s doing calling on the elderly in the church and bringing communion to shut-ins, that sort of thing. And he kind of just took me under his wing and he and his wife, Grace, just loved Jesus and loved each other. And I walked with John through, through the next years where, where his wife, Grace, passed away. And most of his friends passed away. John lived quite a few years. And so I had been in ministry there some time. And he's now into his 90s. And his wife is gone. And his friends are gone. And he became immobilized where he couldn't get out of bed anymore. So he was in a retirement home. So I would go and visit him there and just sit by his bed and ask questions and learn about being a pastor because he was so wise. And I'd send our young pastors to go sit at his bedside and learn from John. But here's what struck me. John always had a sense of the presence of Jesus. Always. After his wife was gone, 
He missed her. But there was never since he was lonely. After most of his friends had passed away, he missed them. But you never had a sense that John was lonely. He always had this deep reality that God was watching over him and with him and near him all the time. And there was just this peace that just sort of permeated his soul and flowed out to other people. And I long for that in my life, and I long for that for you. That you just understand that in all you do, wherever you go, you are never alone. The God who made the universe loves you, and he is with you. He's watching over you in a beautiful, wonderful way. And as I thought about that, I had another song come to my mind uh, about the idea of what would it be like to have a friend so good and so close that that friend never left you alone. And then James Taylor wrote a song called You've Got a Friend. And I love the line, you know, winter, spring, summer, or fall. What is that? All you have to do is call, and I'll be there. And I feel like that's what God does for us by his Holy Spirit. That was a song that I actually found myself thinking as a young person, wouldn't it be neat to have someone that close to you? And you know, I have a wife who I love, who's a dear friend. I have really close friends who I love. But my relationship with Jesus Christ and the closeness I have with him is my closest relationship in all this world. And I'm never alone. Even when I'm alone. You know, do you know what I'm saying? Even when you're alone, you're not alone. And that's God's desire that we would understand that as you walk through your days, he's with you. He watches over you. Let's continue on. In verse two, there's just one little line that tells us that God knows all of my thoughts. It says in verse two, you perceive my thoughts from afar. And that may, that may bother you, that God knows everything I'm thinking. You mean God knows like the stuff that I would never say or I mean, the, the weird, creepy stuff where I wake up from a dream and I go, where did that come from? And he's like, that's in my brain and my mind. And, and you just go, man, my, how, our, our brains can be such a beautiful thing to take us to wonderful places where our brains can wander into the most strange places. God knows every thought. Yes, he does. And he still loves you. He, know, he knows the things that are within you. He knows your motives. It's an amazing reality. But I want to challenge you when you think about, I think our minds can wander places they shouldn't go. We need to know that there's grace when our minds are thinking things we shouldn't be thinking, but also I think we need to learn to train our brains. And that's my challenge, is, is commit to train your brain. Commit to say, I want my brain to think more about things that are good and pure and beautiful and right than about a lot of the garbage that my mind tends to wander into. And so if you're a note taker, write down these three things. There's three ways you can start to train your brain to, to focus more on things that really, you say, okay, God, you know every thought I have. I want to think more thoughts that are pleasing to you, and I want less of the junk that tends to rattle around in my brain. So here's three things. Number one, Scripture, the Bible. I want to challenge you to commit to memory, a verse in the Bible. And if you get a verse committed, then try to commit to memory a few verses. And if you do that, commit to memory a paragraph, maybe a chapter of the Bible. So when your brain starts to wander weird places, you just kind of flush it out by going over Scripture. Maybe a book of the Bible. You say, that's impossible. No, it's not. No, it's not. I had a young guy, a sophomore in high school, when he became a Christian, when I was doing youth ministry years and years ago. His name was Gavin. And Gavin, uh, I, he became a Christian, became out of a really rough background. And he said, man, he said, I got all these weird, bad stuff going through my brain. I said, well, memorize Scripture. He says, I can't memorize the Bible. He says, I had a knife stuck in my head, and now I have a speech impediment, and I don't remember things. And he actually, he threw a knife against a brick wall, it came back stuck in his head. He, he put a knife in his own head, not on purpose. Um, and, he, and so he, he, he said, I've had speech therapy and I just don't, my memory doesn't work very well. I said, well, I still want to challenge you, memorize a verse. He memorized over 20 chapters of Proverbs. Over 20 chapters. And if you're going to memorize something, Proverbs is one of the toughest things to memorize because every verse is like a different little topic going along. It's not like a narrative story that helps you remember what came before it. It's like, boom. And I, we'd be driving somewhere talking and I'd say, Gavin, Proverbs 11. The wise man says, and he'd, like, he'd start right, and he would just run right through it. Proverbs, and it was just, I, I tell, he'd do a whole chapters at a time. But, but that was one of the things that helped him start to just, his mind would go to a place they shouldn't go. He'd just kind of flush it out with God's word over and over, just filling his mind with God's word. Second thing, if you want to, you want to train your brain, listen to good music. Listen to good music. When I say good music, I don't mean the style. I mean the lyrics and the message. Because you know what songs do? Songs get stuck in our soul. Songs get stuck in our mind, and they just rotate through. Have you ever like, heard a song in the morning, and you're like, you're kind of singing. And then like that evening, you find that you're humming or singing the same song. And you're like, well, that's, has that been like going through my brain all day long? And the answer is in most cases, yes. 
And so if you put good, and this is why I think God's given us his mixtape, why God's given us 150 songs, psalms, you know, to, to let the music and the song go through your heart and your mind. So find, you know, look at what you're listening to and say, oh, it doesn't make any difference what I listen to. I think it does if we're cycling thoughts through our mind that are very, very positive and God-honoring or ones that are kind of, kind of just not real positive. It makes a difference. So think about the music you listen to. And then the third thing are the choices of what you view. Just the choices of what you view with your eyes, what you watch in terms of TV and movies. This is something that struck me in the last probably 10 years. Almost, th there's a lot of TV shows and movies now that don't have one positive, redemptive character in the entire cast. It used to always be like, well, there's good guys, well, they're the bad guys, but then they're mostly good guys. But now it's gonna be, it can be just like an entire show, and every single person, there's not one person in the whole cast that you'd say, I want to be like them. And certainly your parents wouldn't want you to be like them. And if there's like one good character by season two, they turn wicked and nasty. You know what I'm talking All of a sudden they're like, oh, they were so sweet in season one, and now they're just as nasty as everybody else. And I'm, and I'm not t t picking certain shows. I'm just saying, look at what you watch, and if you're filling your brain with images and people and stories, ask yourself, are these stories that are redemptive and positive? Or are these people and characters that I would want to emulate my life after? Or would I say I'd never want to be like them? And just kind of think through what it is you're feeding into your brain. And if you're like, well, you know, but all the shows I like have all bad characters. Well, then <laughs> think about that. Um, <laughs> but, and if you're like, well, like you know, and here's the deal. There's 800 channels, so you can find something. You know, learn how to cook broccoli in a way that's tasty on the cooking. cooking you know, fix something that's at least neutral or positive. But just try to, try to feed stuff into your brain that's more positive. God knows all my thoughts. Next in verse 4. God knows all I speak and what I don't speak. God knows everything I say and what I choose not to say. Look at verse 4. Uh, verse 4 says, Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely. That God, you know every word I speak. Before a word's on my tongue, you know it completely. So I think that God would encourage us to learn to harness the power of your words. I mean, learn to say, you've got this little tongue, you've got this mouth and this tongue that speaks. You know, the book of James, chapter 3, talks about be careful with your mouth. Because your mouth, you can say things that burn like a fire. Your, your mouth can run wild. Proverbs says life and death are in the power of the tongue. Our words, the things we speak, can bring life and death. So if you say, God, if you know my words, and you know the words I don't even speak, then God, I pray that you will control my tongue and the things I say. And so here's four challenges. Note takers, write these down. If you're not taking notes, pick one of these and really work at it this week. Number one, declare beauty. Declare beauty. Every time you see something beautiful, say it. Wow, what a beautiful sunset. Wow, what an amazing thing. If, you, if you're a grandparent or a parent and you, you see your, your little child or your grandchild, your little granddaughter or your daughter, and she's three or four years old, and she tries on a new dress, say, oh, you look beautiful. So I don't want to overpraise her. She might become arrogant. Trust me, the world will beat her down every day of her life. You won't overpraise her. You know, she, there's plenty of discouragement out there. You speak words of beauty, and notice those things. Number two, speak words of encouragement. Speak words of encouragement. When you see somebody do something well, tell them. I, I've driven through uh, little fast food places to, to pick something up, and the per when somebody's like clear, they speak clearly, they're warm, they're friendly, they're, they're engaging, they're energetic, I, and I get up to them, I'm, I'm like, thank you so much. I, I've, I've said to people, actually, I said, you know, if you weren't working here, and if I had a spot where I work, I'd hire someone like you because you would just do an amazing job. Because there's so many people just don't give it the energy that, that you would want them to. But so and encourage. Sherry and I were at a conference with the Billy Graham Center in Chicago just about two weeks ago. And we got there a day early for a pre-conference meeting. We had the three-day conference then and we had a post-conference meeting. So we were there at the beginning and the end. And we walked into this church building. First time we walked in, and there's this young guy pushing a cart, chairs and tables, setting stuff up. He pushes it and he sees us, stops, comes over to us, welcomes us, engaging, warm, friendly, welcomes us to the church, goes back to his work. First day of the conference, big opening worship set. You know, music's going, in, and we look up there. The lead worship guy on the stage is this young guy who was pushing, doing the chairs and tables. And I found out later, he's their, their, their main worship leader. But he's there helping and serving and greeting us. We leave the last day. It's post-conference. We get off the elevator to walk out of the church building, and he's right there still working. His name is Callum from Scotland. And he's, he's there after the conference working. 
And Sharon and I just walked over to him, and we just said to him, do you know how you blessed us this week? So I said, you were the first one to greet us. You got such kindness. You have a servant's heart. You're a great worship leader. And then here you are, the conference is over, and you're back working again. And, and I can just tell it meant so much for him that somebody would stop and say, you're doing a great job. We can speak words of blessing and encouragement. Do you notice, do you speak those words? That pleases God. Let him hear you say those things. Number three, stop gossiping. Just stop it. Enough of that, you know. <laughs> Somebody's going to just quit it. It's if you find yourself gossiping, say, God, you hear everything I say. When I'm tearing another human being down that you love, I know this is not your plan. And just, just get that out of your mouth and out of your life. And then number four, beware of criticism. Beware of criticism. Now, it is good and helpful when you notice something that needs to be changed. It's the problem of sharing with the right person in the right way. That's not what I'm talking about. If you see a concern, you go to the right person with the right heart and the right way and say, I'm concerned about this. That, we should do that. I'm just talking about the constant pointing out what's wrong with everything. Negativity and criticism. Beware of that. Watch your words if they become critical. Verse 5 of Psalm 139. We learn that God is all around me and his hand is on me. And I love this picture of God's hand being on us. Look at verse 5. You hem me in behind and before. Listen to this. And you lay your hand upon me. I think about when my boys were little, how they'd be standing near me or sitting, I just kind of want to toss with their hair, put my, I just wanted to put my hand on them because I love them. And, and the sense that God looks at you and, and your hand's on me and he guides you and he protects you and he knits you together in your mother's womb and his hand is upon you. And just understand the closeness of God. God is tender and protective of his children. He watches over you. He looks out for you. He loves you. Understand that. And then in verses 7 through 12, we learn that God is present with me at all times and in all places. And, and, and it goes on, where can I go from your spirit? If I go to the highest heaven, the deepest depths, God, you're there. And, and I love how David says, even if I go to the, if I, you, know, I can, you can always hide in the dark. You can get away and hide in the dark. Not from God, because for, for God, even the darkest places, there's light. Why? Because God is light. And when he's present, it illuminates everything. There's nowhere you'll ever go that God won't be there. Whether you think you've wandered, he's still there. Whether you think he's forgotten you and left you, he's still there. He's always with you. There's that little poem that has become so used that people, oh, it's just this old cheesy poem about footsteps in the stand and there's, you know, on the wall and there's the poster and there's two sets of footprints and then all of a sudden there's one set. But the simple idea of that is so profound and that is that the person looks back at their life and they say, there's always two footsteps, me and Jesus with me. And in the toughest times, I'm walking alone. There's only one set of footprints and I'm all alone. And God says, no. No, when you look and see one set of footprints, it's not that you're alone. That's when I picked you up and carried you. That's when you were hurting the most. I didn't leave you. I took you in my arms and I carried you. That's the heart of God through every moment of your life, from the womb when, when he formed you to the last breath you take until you walk into eternity. And that's why Jesus came. So you'll walk into eternity through faith in Jesus with him and not without him. So you can feel his arms around you forever and ever and ever. And the last part of the passage, verses 13 to 16, teaches us that God's love for you and presence begins in the womb and ends the last breath you take on this life and continues on for eternity. God's love and care continues from, uh, from the end of this life and into eternity. And, and just that picture, I mean, think about it. Psalm 139 says that in your mother's womb, he knew you, he loved you. I love this. Every day of my life, every day of my life was written in your book before one of them came to be. God's hand is on you more profoundly than you know. The God of the universe shaped you and formed you and loved you in your mother's womb. The God of the universe has been with you every step of your journey. For me, every day I lived and every year I lived, before I was a Christian, I didn't believe in God. God was still there. He loved me. He had a plan for me and his hand was upon me. He was trying to draw me to himself. Now I had to choose to follow him, but God was always there. And the same is true for you. To this, to this day today, no matter how lonely you might feel, go and read this psalm if you're feeling lonely, if you're feeling like, where God, where are you? And it will just remind you every moment, with every heartbeat, with every breath, God is with you. And then into your, the last days of your life, 
He's there. He's present. Like I experienced with Pastor John Shaw, where he just had this profound sense that he's in the arms of Jesus, even when nobody else is around. All the way through life. And then, through faith in Jesus Christ, by receiving his grace, we walk with God into eternity. That's the God we gather to worship. That's the song of your life. Whether you know it or not, there is a God who loves you, who made you, and who is with you. And he wants to enter a closer relationship than you know. So if you're a follower of Jesus, for anyone here who's already a follower of Jesus, just hold to him and notice his presence and thank him and praise him and live each moment in the glory of his presence. And if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, say, God, I want to know you and I want to walk with you through this life and forever. And call out to him, say, I want to know this Jesus who's opened a way for a relationship with God for eternity, and he will open his arms to you. That's the invitation he gives. Will you pray with me? Oh God, thank you. Praise you. That you love us. You, you know us, God. Everything about us, there's nothing hidden from you. Every thought, every word, every action, and you still are fond of us. You still love us. You still came, Jesus, and died for us and rose again to give us new life if we would just simply come to you by faith. And so we pray, O oh God, we can walk in the reality of your presence and your power and your love and your grace. And then, Lord, even right now, as an act of our worship, as we give back, as we give our gifts, whether we do it in an offering plate or online or however we choose to give, Lord, as we give right now, will you just let our hearts acknowledge that you are a good God, a good Father who watches over your children. And as we give back, we do it knowing that you've been good to us first. So we give to you with joy. And we pray that these gifts would be used right now to help others know the greatness of your love and your amazing grace and your presence. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.